I am an anthropologist and being so, one of my professional obligations is also to criticize. That's what I'll do a little today. And um, the two recent events that stirred really heated discussions about the role new media plays in uh, contemporary journalism was the uh, so-called Iran's Twitter revolution in, back in June, when protesters were not only using uh, this micro-blogging service to mobilize, but also the international news media, such as CNN, uh, extensively based their coverage of the event on reposting uh, Iran's Iranian tweets uh, in the news. The other event was the... Uh, okay, here it is was when the Salahis crashed Obama's uh, dinner party uninvited, they posted their photos on Facebook. And uh, these photos immediately appeared on New York Times and the, in the other mass media causing the scandal. So although on a much smaller scale, I do my research, uh, ethnographic research for my dissertation in Puerto Iguazu, Argentina, in the border region between Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil to be more precise with journalists who only began to use new media forums, primarily um, uh, personal blogs, YouTube videos, and Facebook postings. And based on my work with this marginal media organization, um, the question I would like to raise today is as follows. For what reasons and how successfully do journalists use new intersubjective and intertextual <coughs> communication technologies in addition to or in opposition to the traditional news media? Or, in other words, how does the new and the so-called old media map onto each other? So, to help me with that, I'll discuss one case study. And on March 4th, 2008, the biggest Argentine daily, Clarín, reported that in the rural Misiones province, uh, bordering Brazil and Paraguay, one farm worker was diagnosed with yellow fever. Because yellow fever had claimed no official human victims in Argentina since 1841, this news was important enough to become the subject of editorials. However, it also merged into a much larger phenomenon or much larger trend of representing this region. Because in the national and international media, the three borders region, or also known as Frontera Caliente or Hot Border, is seen as the haven for organized crime, such as drug trafficking, human smuggling, uh, human trafficking, drug smuggling, money laundering, terrorism, so it is violent and dangerous. And therefore this reappearing disease added a new dimension to this discourse about the civilized Argentine state and the very barbaric border residents. Yellow fever was depicted as originating both across the human nature divide and the Argentina neighboring countries divide as the media, the national media, said that the disease is coming from Paraguay and Brazil. Um, and therefore, when the Argentine government issued alerts of an epidemic, it, uh, this new uh, epidemiological discourse that was spreading in the mass media legitimized medical interventions in the area as a means to reaffirm state presence. And surveillance in the form of immunizations enabled the government to see if it shows who, where, and when was moving in its territorial margins. Two weeks later, La Voz de Cataratas, or The Voice of the Waterfalls, the newspaper I am working with. At that time, it was only a local weekly, print weekly, uh, but it changed, as I'll say. Um, it carried the front page with the famous Iguazu waterfall stained yellow under a headline, Tourist Fever in the Waterfalls. The article claimed that despite the forecast of the national media that Nobody will come to this area because now there's yellow fever there. In fact, more and not fewer people came. And interviewed visitors said they had taken precautions but were not afraid of the disease. The editor-in-chief of this local paper, Kelly Ferreira, chose not to receive the vaccine at all when it was distributed to everybody because she said that uh, the threat is not real. There is no yellow fever here, challenging the representations of the national media and sort of ridiculing government strategies to impose stricter sanitary regulations. In other words, when the national government through mass media tried to create an ethnically charged epidemiological frontier, blaming the virus on the Paraguayans uh, crossing the international border, local cultural producers who are both everyday actors in the situation 
in this peculiar public sphere of in between the states, protested both in the writings and with their own bodies. And the waste disease is discursively contested through different media, such as the most influential daily Clarin, situated in the capital city of Buenos Aires, and uh, a very small but independent newspaper on the border can tell us about, a lot about the relationship between state and media. So it is uh, clear that now media is no longer seen as part of the Habermasian public sphere, or at least it is part of a very distorted version of it. And Pierre Bourdieu, a French sociologist, notes that the journalistic field is anyways very weakly autonomous. That is, it is strongly dependent on political and economic powers. So as in the case of yellow fever in Argentina, the national media is often the voice of the state. It circulates the official governmental discourses that give legitimacy to modes of rule and then justify certain uh, government policies and uh, actions. However, unlike journalists working for the nationwide media, these people I am working with um, situated in geographical, political, and discursive peripheries have a much more contradictory relationship with the state. Media ethnographer Brian Larkin uses the term signal and noise to analyze what happens when media get dislodged from state projects. And he suggests that signal is the connection between media and modes of rule, while noise refers to unstable consequences media bring about due to the interference produced by cultural values, or in this case, uh, these journalists of La Voz de Cataratas are both being both cultural producers and everyday actors remembering uh, previous state violence in the area during the military dictatorship uh, and also emphasizing the government's neglect of the region economically and politically simply perceive many issues, not only the disease discourse that I'm talking here about, but also issues of violence rather differently. They blame, for example, that the main source of violence is the state as opposed to these people transgressing the border and selling fruits on the other side, because they do that for survival reasons, and the, the somebody to blame is the state. So what role do new media forms play in this negotiation over an epidemiological alert or like who is to blame for violence in the region, and how are local journalists using new media technologies to present alternative, narrative, alternative narratives on the issue? Soon after this yellow fever scale, La Voz de Catarata stopped being uh, published as a weekly because the cost of having an independent, politically non-aligned uh, paper in the city which had around 60,000 residents proved to be too high and the last issues were uh, distributed for free. So since then, uh, La Voz de Cataratas became an exclusively digital daily um, and uh, it started to use a variety of new media forms, such as uh, Facebook uh, postings and YouTube videos, and uh, also personal blogs to reach to wider audiences cheaper and faster. Um, the major appeal of videos on YouTube is for, for the journalists I spoke to is to, con is to convince the audience of the objectivity and transparency uh, of the media for depicting the social reality because they say that the camera lens, especially if it can be live broadcast of the like we have here today, is less likely to distort the image of the area than written words, than articles. And they see internet as a supposedly power-free channel for making the voices heard. However, the problem is that um, even though uncensored with regards to their content, these videos or these narratives they produce do not make it to the screens of the national television and do not in any ways alter the narratives produced by the national press. So they prove the possibility but not the reality of the public sphere, although as we see here today, public sphere is not necessarily a good thing anyways. So <laughs> the major part of the audience for whatever these people try to show and contradict the dominant narratives. The audience for all of this is the same local Iguazu community. So a number of anthropologists working with media observed that circulation, instead of being a passive media delivery system, is actively constructing publics on the uneven social terrain. However, uh, so we can see that the national, you know, big media corporations have the power, both technological and uh, in a way political, to spread their message to everyone. Uh, however, 
the alternative local analysis of the situation do not speak back to the center and remain constrained within this rather small circuit. So uh, to answer my own question that I raised, raised in the beginning, I think that the, the new media map onto the already pre-existing power structure of the mass media, that is, it helps the big guys, but from what I've seen in my work so far, maybe it's very recent because they only started to use these things a year or so ago, it doesn't help the small ones, the little ones. Mm.